every theory makes some assumptions. So valence bond theory also has its own assumptions. So this is the first assumption of the valence bond theory. It states that the empty orbitals are present on the central atom which are used for making coordinate bond with ligands. Means there should be empty orbitals always present on the central metal atom. If empty orbitals are not the present, then the central metal atom will not be able to take up the electrons from the ligands. For instance, and like an analogy, there is a neighbor and there are you, okay? And your neighbor has a fridge and he wants to give it to you. But if you do not have space in your house for keeping that fridge, you cannot take that fridge from your neighbor. Similarly, if the metal wants to take away the electrons from the ligand, then the metal has to have some space to store those electrons. And therefore, that metal should have an empty orbital where it can store those electrons which are donated by the ligand. So, that is why the empty orbital should be present on the central metal atom always. The next assumption, it states that the ns, np, nd or n-1d orbitals on a metal atom, they hybridize to yield a orbitals of equivalent energy. Like when we talk about, let's say, we take scandium. It belongs to the fourth period. So, its outermost orbitals are 4s, 4p and 4d. 4s, 4p and 4d. So, this is your ns, this is your np and this is your nd. So, the n-1d is going to be 3d, right? This is the n-1d orbital. Now, what this assumption states is either these or these, they hybridize together and they form orbitals which are equivalent in energy. Right now, they are not equivalent in energy. 3s has a different energy than 4p, which has a different energy than 4s, which has a different energy than 4d. But when they hybridize together, they form a set of orbitals which are equivalent in energy. The next assumption, it states that the geometry can be octahedral, tetrahedral, square planar, etc. What happens is, when those orbitals I told you about, they hybridize together, they give you a specific geometry, okay? And it depends upon which orbitals are getting hybridized. The geometry depends upon which orbitals are getting hybridized, which specific orbitals, whether it's dxy or whether it's dyz. And the geometry can be octahedral, okay? And it can be tetrahedral, Octahedral is, we have done octahedral, it is like this, 6 coordination number. Tetrahedral, in tetrahedral metal is present and the ligands are directed at the corners of a tetrahedron. Square planar, it can be square planar, okay. They can be also others also. So, now let us see which orbitals are necessary for hybridization for which geometry, that is which orbitals on hybridization will we give that specific geometry. So, this is a table which states the hybridization and those orbitals which are hybridizing to give that specific geometry. Like we talk about sp3, sp3 is tetrahedral. In its case, the s orbital, the px orbital, the py orbital and the pz orbital, they hybridize together to give sp3. dsp2 is square planar. In the square planar, the s hybridizes, px hybridizes, py hybridizes, okay. There is no pz because you can see there is only p2, that means only two p orbitals are getting hybridized. And only one d orbital is getting hybridized and that d orbital is specifically the d x square y square orbital. This is, that is the axial d orbital. This is the specific one. You cannot just use any random d orbital for hybridization and get a square planar complex. A square planar complex will only be formed if d x square y square is used for hybridization. Next, we have sp3 d. So, this is trigonal pyramidal geometry it will give you trigonal bipyramidal geometry it will give you and the orbitals which undergo hybridization to give trigonal bipyramidal geometry are s, px, py, pz and dz square. Again it is p3 
So that is why 3p orbitals are used. All of the 3p orbitals are used and there is only one d here. So only one of the d orbitals is used and that d orbital is the dz square. The next is octahedral geometry. In this case, S is used Px, Py, Pz, that is all of the three orbitals are used as well as both of the axial d orbitals, that is dx square, y square and dz square. Next one is also an octahedral geometry. Right now, it looks the same, but we will know what is the difference between sp3d2 and d2 sp3 in our coming slides. So, this is also octahedral. And in this case also dx square y square that is both of the axial d orbitals and all of the 3p orbitals as well as the one s orbital is used. So these are the orbitals which are used for the hybridization and which give these specific geometries. So the next assumption it states that every ligand must have an orbital which contains the lone pair. That is basically saying that if you want your neighbor to give you a fridge, the neighbor should have a fridge. Okay. That is what it states that every ligand should have at least one orbital which contains a lone pair. If that ligand does not have a lone pair, how will it give it to the metal atom? So that is what this assumption states that every ligand has should have at least one orbital containing a lone pair so that it can donate that lone pair to the metal atom. The next assumption it states that the empty hybrid orbitals of the metal ion or the atom, it overlaps with the filled orbitals of the ligand to form the metal ligand coordinate or covalent bonds. Like if we talk about your metal, this is the orbital of the metal, this is the axis, these are the axis and this is the orbital of the metal. Now what is happening? This empty orbital of the metal is going to overlap with a filled orbital it is going to overlap with a filled orbital of the ligand like this and here a metal ligand coordinate bond is going to get formed. Now let us move to our next assumption. In this it states if inner d orbitals are used for bonding in octahedral complexes the hybridization is d2 sp3 like we were talking about scandium right in scandium the inner d orbital was 3d 4s 4p and we had 4d so the inner d orbital is 3d and the outer d orbital is 4d so if inner d orbital is used like 3d is used two orbitals of 3d are used one orbital of s is 4s is used and three orbitals of 4p is used like two orbitals of 3d one orbital of 4s and three orbitals of 4p then the hybridization will be d2 sp3 similarly if outer d orbitals are used and we get an octahedral complex the hybridization will be sp3 d2 Again, we take if we take the example of scandium or any other your d block element in the period fourth. So that's 3d, 4s, 4p, and 4d. In this case, if you use 1s orbital, 3p orbitals, and 2 orbitals of 4d, then your configuration or your hybridization is going to be sp3 d2. So that is how your D2 sp3 and sp3 d2 are different. In D2 sp3 inner d orbitals are used, in sp3 d2 outer d orbitals are used. Now the next assumption states that if a complex has unpaired electrons it is going to be paramagnetic and if a complex has paired electrons it is going to be diamagnetic. So paramagnetic are those which are weakly attracted in the presence of an external magnetic field and diamagnetic are those which are repelled by the presence of an external magnetic field. So that we can predict whether it is going to be paramagnetic or whether it is going to be diamagnetic on the basis of the number of unpaired electrons that is going to be in that complex. Mm -hmm.